Um, hi, everyone. We are just waiting for a few more, one or two more minutes for everyone to join in. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, is it's my screen okay? Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining for today's webinar by Professor Sir C. Pillai uh, on the topic of tips to write a high impact journal paper and on an editor's viewpoint. So before starting the webinar, um, I have a few announcements. So pl please keep your cameras and microphones turned off during, during the talk. And if you have any questions, uh, please put it in the chat at the end of the, um, in the chat. So we will be discussing at the end of the presentation. 
So for today's uh, webinar is organized by International PhD School on Advanced Oxidation Processes. So I would like to give a brief introduction on that. So the International PhD School on Advanced Oxidation Processes is an initiative of academics and scientists with a strong internationally recognized expertise in the environment applications of AOPs. So the main aim uh, for, this, uh, uh, for starting this international PhD school was to promote the higher education of young scientists in this research field in AOPs. So it is founded in June 2014. So it started as an uh, European uh, PhD school on AOPs, but it became international uh, school on AOPs on 2018 when the Latin America institution also joined in this initiative. So um, the International PhD School on AOPs is mainly coordinated by Professor Luigi Rizzo from the University of Salerno, Italy. And the European uh, coordinator is Professor Sixto Malato. And uh, Professor Ricardo Torres Palma is acting as the coordinator for Latin American institutes. So currently we have 70 scientific committee members and 50 of our, uh, including 51 institutions from 24 different countries. And we have 116 registered PhD students in this school. So one of the main initiatives uh, for uh, this school was to organize a specific training, especially for the EO, AOPs, based on AOPs events such as summer school and webinars and free of charge for the school members and to promote the networking within uh, the school members for, have, for new opportunities, especially for uh, applications of the proposals or the publications as well. So, and we also keeping uh, PhD students updated about new positions, conferences and other relevant news regarding the research. So if you would like to get affi affiliated, uh, 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 affiliated PhD student in International PhD School on AOPs, uh, please contact Professor Louis Gerizzo. He's the coordinator of the school for the further information. So from 2014, from the start of the school, we had three summer schools. We have a summer school every once in every two years. The first one was in Italy and the one was Portugal and last one was in 2019 in Spain. So, um, so right now, because of the pandemic, we are doing a lot of webinar programs. So uh, International PhD School on AOPs initiated the webinar series of webinar programs from to, uh, 2020 November. So right now, today, we are having a talk from Professor Pillay on its eighth webinar on this uh, webinar program. So all, all this information and details on attending the webinars uh, are will be posted in a research kit link uh, of International PhD School on Advanced Works process web page and we, we have also a YouTube channel and um, for the international PhD school as well so all, all these talks are recorded even today's talk as well so we will be uploading in the YouTube so you can rewatch it again and you can also fo follow uh, Professor Luigi Riso in LinkedIn for the future um, um, updates and as to know more of scheduled event so for today's uh, talk. So I, so we have a, a talk from Professor Suresh Sipilai of Institute of Technology Sligo on the topic of, of tips to write on a, a high impact journal paper on an editor's viewpoint. So Professor Suresh Sipilai obtained his PhD from Trinity College Dublin and then performed his postdoctoral research in California Institute of Technology USA. Upon his completion after the appointment, he returned to College Dublin as a research fellow before joining Crest to you, Dublin, as a senior scientist in April uh, 2004. He has joined IT Sligo in 2013 as a senior lecturer in nanotechnology and currently leads nanotechnology and bioengineering research group in IT Sligo. He has also completed an executive MBA from Dublin City University in 2009. He was a recipient of the 2019 Boyle Higgins Award from the Institute of Chemistry, Ireland. He's also a recipient of the Industry Technologies Award 2011 for licensing functional co coatings to Irish companies. And Pillay was also the recipient of the Hot House Commercialization Award in 2009 from the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation, and also the recipient of the Enterprise Ireland Research Commercialization Award in 2019 as well. He, Professor Pillay has also been nominated for the One to Watch Award in 2009 for co commercialization R&D work. 
in Enterprise Ireland, and he is the national delegate and a technical expert for ISO Standardization Committee and European Standardization Committee on photocatalytic materials. Professor Pillai has published several scientific articles in leading paper and leading peer-reviewed journals, has contributed to several book chapters, having now more than 14,000 citations have an age index of 50. And he has also presented in more than 50 international conferences and has delivered over 100 of inter in international invited talks. Professor Pillay has also been invited to deliver keynote or plenary speeches at various international conferences as well. He, Professor Pillay is the lead inventor of two granted US patents and one UK patent and a number of international patents as well. He is an associate editor for the Chemical Engineering Journal and editorial board member for Applied Catalyst B now. So I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Pillai for his talk. Now the screen is yours. Is the screen okay, Sneha? Yes, it is. It's good, yeah. Okay, one minute. I just want to open the. Hello, all. Uh, uh, I have slightly modified the title, uh, Tips for Improved Manuscript Preparation and Editor's Perspective. Thanks, Neha, for the kind introduction. Um, so I was also a PhD student like you several years ago, uh, almost 21 years ago. I was a student in uh, Trinity College, Dublin, and uh, one uh, wintry morning, um, I was passing through the corridor and I met my professor, uh, Professor John Kelly. I had a few uh, micrographs with me and I showed that to John and he said that it's interesting and he told me, Suresh, let us write a paper. And I had no clue on how to write a paper. Then he made a very important point that write it like a story. How should I write a paper like a story? So that's what we are going to discuss today. How to write your paper like a story or screenplay for a movie. So at the end of this talk, you will be an expert in writing a paper or you will be a, an expert in writing a screenplay for a movie. So writing a research paper is an art. It's almost like writing a screenplay for a movie. So let us start talking about a famous movie, Titanic. You may have all seen this. The story is about a 17 year old lady traveling in a ship, Rose with her fiance Carl, and she meets this uh, wonderful gentleman, Jack, and she fell in love with him. And, 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 and the story goes on. And it's also about a ship traveling from Belfast, built in Belfast, moved to Liverpool, and their ship starts a journey from Liverpool, then going to Cork in Ireland, and then from Cork, and traveling through the Atlantic and hits an iceberg. So that's the story of Titanic. When you write the screenplay of such movie, if you write, just talk about the ship, its travel, 
and uh, hitting the iceberg. That will look like a documentary. That's not a kind of big impact movie. So in order to make it a movie, you have to add additional stories into that. So the story thread is the ship, which is the Titanic, Jack, Ross, their romance, and a collision with an iceberg. But there are a number of sub stories as well. And the most important thing is that different people connect their life with different part of the story. If you remember that movie, Titanic, there are a number of other characters as well. Edward John Smith, many people could associate their life with John Smith, captain, planning his final voyage before retiring. A number of retired or retiring people can connect their life with John Smith's life. Rosa's fiance, Carl Hickey and her mother Ruth, some of some um, viewers or their life can be associated with Carl Hickey's life or Ruth's life. Bruce Ismay, a rich, ignorant, upper class man, and many other characters and events. And different people connect their life with the different types of events in the movie. So a paper is like that, a different part of the research publication. Different people look for different information. We will talk a number of examples on that. So in a movie, there should be a logical progression. There is a logical progression in that. When we look at Titanic again, so a ship start, built in Belfast, starting its voyage from Liverpool, going to Cork, collecting more passengers, and traveling to, through the Atlantic, and then hits an iceberg. And, and there are a number of other sub-stories within that story. So that is how the movie is progressing in a kind of logical way. When you write a paper, it should flow like that. So I'll show you an example. Um, one of my recent PhD students, Priyanka, she got the award recently. So I, that's why I took this paper. She got the award for her thesis, uh, national award, the best uh, chemistry graduate from uh, Ireland. So the paper is about the photocatalytic application of a composite. Silver bismuth sulfide and TiO2, heteros structure. And this paper got a lot of attention. Uh, this has uh, been cited a few times, um, like within one year. And let us see why, uh, how she wrote this paper. What are the important aspects and how we can compare that with the Titanic movie. So, this is the graphical abstract. From the graphical abstract, it's, it's, this is like the poster for the Titanic. You know, like this is what Priyanka is advertising about her work. From looking at the figure itself, you will get an idea about what she is talking about. She's talking about photocatalysis, hydrogen generation, degradation of some chemicals, and its antimicrobial applications. So the main story is, Photocatalysis, we can connect this to uh, the, the, the travel of the ship, okay, or the main story, okay? So there are a number of stories, hydrogen generation, for example, uh, um, Rosas and Jack's story, or uh, Ismay's story, something like that. So every, there are a number of additional sub-stories uh, in that paper. Also, there, she has given a good theoretical background about that work. So she did a lot of theoretical modeling with her collaborators to support her invention. So the main part of the story, of course, is the photocatalysis. Okay, so how um, uh, the, the particular composite she made showed better photocatalytic activity. Okay, that's the main part of the story, but there are a number of other sub-stories, such as hydrogen production. She also studied hydrogen production sh show that this catalyst can be 
used for other applications and also antimicrobial applications. The same catalyst can be used for antimicrobial applications. And also, she did a lot of characterization, for example, XPS, FTIR, Raman spectroscopy, HRTM, and SEM. So these are the characterization she did, and she explained it very well. And this is one of the few papers explain the, um, uh, the impact of, uh, of oxygen vacancies, uh, the formation of TA3+, plus, uh, or formation of TA4+, plus, the impact of uh, silver, all those things are incorporated in this paper, or silver bismuth sulfide, and its impact on TaO2, the TaO bond formation. There's a lot of information on XPS is also included in that paper. That's a part of the substory she has given in that paper. And there are also a number of other stories, such as uh, DFT studies, uh, comparison with the theory and experiments, the mechanism of photo catalysis. So it's a combination of a number of different aspects. Okay, it has a main story, but it has a number of additional sub stories to substantiate the main story or to um, give more impact to the main story of the paper. So why this work uh, cited? Is it because of the main story or it's because of the sub stories? The, the answer is both because it's not an extraordinary paper. It's, it's, it's just uh, maybe another photocatalytic paper. But the way she wrote was, or the way she presented was excellent. Uh, the, the, the type of photocatalyst she has selected, the theoretical studies she has carried out, and uh, the way she explained the paper, the substories or the substances she has incorporated in that paper was very important. And also because of the XPS, it goes, got a lot of attention because she explained that part very beautifully. And people who are writing on XPS, for example, on TAO2, who referred that paper. So when you are writing a paper, you need to have a main thread or main part of the story and then you need to have a lot of sub stories to to give importance to the main story or substantiate the main story of that work. So writing a paper is like writing a screenplay or directing a movie because you have to focus on the story. There should be a logical progression and you need to keep a suspense. You need to have a lot of sub stories, a good conclusion and a takeaway message. What's the takeaway message from Priyanka's work? Because she has made a catalyst, that's, that's a good photo catalyst, but it can be used for a number of other future applications. For example, hydrogen production, or, for, or, or can be used as an antimicrobial agent. She is pointing towards a number of future applications. So that is the takeaway message from Priyanka's work. And every story or every paper should have a take home message. So the ingredients of a good movie, what are the ingredients? Uh, a good screenplay, you name it. A number of factors influence the success of a good movie. Okay, so similarly, the ingredients of a good journal paper are the novelty and innovation. That's the very, very important part. As an editor, that's the first thing I check. What's the novelty of the paper? What is the innovation that particular paper brings to the table? And what's, what are the competitive advantages of the current technique? Is the technique new? Is the methodology they have used innovative enough? The next thing would be excellent coverage of the previous literature. Why it is important to address previous literature? That is how you identify the gap. That is how you see what is the work 
which is already done. And what is missing? And that missing part is the gap. Also, you need to have good data and analysis with strong literature support. When you write your discussion part, you need to support your discussions with, with the support of previous literature. For example, you can say that this is in line with Kelly et al. Kelly et al's work, which was published in 1986. Or you can say that this is contradictory to the work which was published by Kim and his co workers in 2011. Then you need to explain why your work is different. So that is how you make a strong discussion. That is how you make a thought-provoking discussion part. Once you have the discussion, then you can talk about the conclusions. And always remember that conclusion, conclusions and abstracts are totally different. We will discuss that later, uh, how you write an abstract. Conclusion is conclusion of the work. Abstract is something different. You should put more time to write an abstract. So we'll discuss that in a few minutes, how to write an abstract. So just some history, the peer review process started several decades ago. Uh, it, it's actually started in the 17th century when it was known as the Inquisition of the Holy Roman and Catholic Church. So, Peer review is very, very important. Whatever you publish should be peer reviewed by experts in that particular area. So when you start writing your paper, the most important thing to start, uh, thing to remember is write first and edit later. And this is the, this is what I always, tell my PhD researchers and postdocs, you start writing, put all your results in a word template and start filling the date details and data, start comparing, put all that, fill it and then start editing. I don't know how many of you are story writers or short story writers, how you write a story? You write first, you write your thoughts first, then you keep on editing until it became the full story. You may change the climax of the story. You may change the introduction. You may change the, how the characters are discussing each other or, or, or conver their conversation. You will edit it. So stories are not written they are rewritten. So your paper is, is a product of a number of different drafts. In many cases, like we save it as like D1, D2, D3, and in some cases, the drafts go up to 35 or 37 or 40. Every time you edit it, every time you refine it, it will be a new paper. So you have to do a number of edits before you submit to a journal. So write first and edit later and edit several times by you, your supervisor, your colleagues, your co-authors. So why should you publish? It's, it's a part of the social responsibility to transfer knowledge because your research is funded by the public. So you have a social responsibility to transfer that knowledge to the public. And it's a part of the scientific research process. It's very important for you as well, for your graduation and for your career progression. And it can be considered as your contribution towards the scientific world. And that is how the science advances. 
look at any type of area, biotechnology, nanotechnology, cell biology, how we create knowledge by publishing work and then contributing that to the knowledge area. That is how you develop knowledge. So it's a part of our social responsibility. And very important point, if you have a pen and pencil, write it down. Research not communicated is equal to research not done. Research not communicated is equal to research not done. If you don't communicate your research to the public, they wouldn't know about it. So it's very, very important to publish your research. How about negative results? Negative results are also results. For example, if you are um, doing uh, an organic synthesis to develop a new drug, and you made sure that every protocols, procedures, everything you have carried out is right, but you didn't get the result. It's probably because that route didn't work out. It was not feasible. And you have a responsibility to let the world know that if you go through that a particular route, it wouldn't work. And there are certain journals which will publish negative results also. So I'm a great believer in publishing negative results because negative results are also results, which shows that those particular routes wouldn't work. But it should be genuine. It should be genuine and you have to make sure that that is absolutely right. That particular way did not work. And what should you publish? Results of new and original results, new methods and methodologies, reviews, uh, feature articles, perspectives. Also you can publish technical updates. And what should not be published? This is very impor important. What should not be published? Most importantly, duplication of your or others previous work. Inconclusive results and reports with no novelty or innovation. So this is the most important thing. You need to look into your paper and see or identify the innovation or identify the novelty of that particular work. And you have to justify that with previous literature. Where to submit? Uh, things to be considered, uh, first is the impact factor of the journal and also uh, uh, possible future citations. And also who, uh, who reads your work? You may publish in a uh, general journal such as Nature Science or Cell, or you publish in a kind of um, very specialized journals. Apply catalysis be uh, the chemical engineering journal, these are all kind of specialized journals in that particular area. So how would you decide that? It's, de it's depending on the impact of the work and also it, it depends on the speciality of that particular area. What is the impact factor of a journal? Impact factor is a measure uh, of the average number of citations to, a, to recent articles published in a particular journal. For example, how you calculate the impact factor? This is the calculation of 2018 impact factor, A over B. So A is the number of times the article cited, and B is the total number of papers published in 2016 and 2017. When you calculate the impact factor of 2018, you consider the number of papers cited in 2016 and 17, uh, and those were cited and indexed by journalists during 2018, okay? So the number of times the article cited over the total number of papers published. 
So 2018 impact factor A or B is equal to, so if you have 800 site or, or a particular journal has 800 citations in 2016 and 17, and uh, it has published 200 articles, the impact factor of that journal is four. So that is how the impact factor is calculated. So how papers are based on impact factor of journal? This is a, a simple cartoon. Uh, it doesn't work like this always, but just wanted to give you an idea about how it works. So high impact journal is kind of law of gravity. Okay, so, and the low impact paper is equal to oranges also fall, follow the law of gravity. For example, the first uh, two dimensional material, graphene, Okay, that's kind of very high impact. So you can publish in uh, Nature or Science. And uh, you functionalize graphene, for example. So that will go into a low impact journal. How the peer review process happens? When the paper arrives at the journal's editorial office, the editor reviews the paper by himself or herself first, and then they assign to an associate editor and then the associate editor assigns to the peer review or peer reviewers or technical experts. So where to start? So first is read a few papers from various potential journals. For example, if you are thinking of publishing a paper in uh, Applied Catalysis B or uh, chemical engineering journal or ACS catalysis. You need to start reading a few papers from that particular journal. Also, you need to download the guidelines for author from that particular journal and see that, how to write or how to format that particular paper. You need to do a lot of preparations. As Benjamin Franklin said, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. So before you start writing the paper, you need to ask a few questions about your work. What is the novelty? And what are the innovation? Is it a complete study? Did I finish all possible characterizations? Do I still find any gap? What are the objectives? You need to write the objectives. Do I have solutions for all the research questions? If yes, then you can start writing it. So how to identify the novelty? You do the literature search. and then look into that and then see that your work is filling that gap. You identify the gap by doing the literature search and then your, this particular work fill that gap and that is the novelty or innovation of that work. You are filling the gap in the existing knowledge. So after that, you can decide which journal, you identify your audience, who will re read your paper? Is it a general paper published in, for example, American Chemical Society, it has a wider audience, or would you go to ACS Catalysis? Because most of the readers will be working in the catalysis area. So you need to decide where would your paper get more attention. So you need to identify your audience, like a movie, okay? And look at your own references. That will give an idea about where would you publish. You should also look at the impact factor of the journal. And also, like it's important as, a, as a, um, an emerging researcher to get citations. So you need also to consider possibility to get citations. 
So the general structure of a full article is title. Of course, the title is first, then authors, abstract, keywords, introduction, experiments or methods, results and discussion, conclusions, acknowledgements, references, and also supplementary materials. And this may not be the writing order. Every different people have different strategy to write a paper, but this is the way I used to write. When I have a lot of results, the first thing I do, because we all have starting troubles, where to start? How should I start? So my recommendation is, you put all your data, your figures, your tables in a plain word document. And you have passed that hurdle of where to start. So you have already started. So once you have all the figures and tables, your data, you can start filling up. So once you have your figures, then write down what the figure is, the implications. So that is going to be your results. So you have already started there. Then you can write uh, the, the results, the discussions. You can compare your work with existing research. You can write the discussion. Then you can write the conclusions. Experiments and methodology, you already have it in your laboratory notebook. Write it down. If it was published for another paper in a kind of similar way, you need to rephrase it. Because it's very, very important that even that part has to be rephrased. Otherwise, it will show us a similarity or, or plagiarism for, for a paper. For example, um, like the, the main problem I find with many papers is that when I look into the authenticate or plagiarism report, I see like 25 or 27 percentage of similarity. And most of this, in most cases, that comes from the experimental part. So if you are publishing a similar work or additional work of an, or, or, or extension of a, of a work, you have to rephrase that um, in the experimental part as well. So it's very, very important to remember that experiments and methodology needs to rephrase for, for your new paper. Uh, then the introduction. Introduction is, is, um, is about talking about previous work, the literature search, you always give a kind of global perspective, then a local perspective, then what is what is what has happened in the previous few years. Then you identify the gap. So once you have the gap, once you identify the gap, you can explain the novelty of that work and then the objectives. So that is the way it should follow. Then you can put the references. Abstract should be the last thing. You should put a lot of time in writing the abstract because that is what the editor is going to read most. He or she might read it a few times to see what exactly you have presented. That is your pitch. So take plenty of time to write, rewrite, revise, and refine your abstract. You also need to give keywords. Title is very, very important. Give an appropriate title. You also need to have a good TOC figure and you need to write highlights of your work in less than 80 words or 85 words, sorry, 85 characters. So those are very, very important. So the art of writing the title of your paper if you want to get more information, Prashant Kamath, uh, he's the uh, editor for um, Applied uh, ACS Energy Letters. So Prashant wrote a number of articles on um, tips to write papers, uh, the art of writing in the title of your paper. You should spend a lot of time to identify the 
title. You should identify maybe three or four different titles. Discuss with, co with your colleagues, your co-authors, to see that which one is more appropriate. And the title should be grammatically sound. It should resonate with the table of contents figure or the graphical abstract image provided. Short titles are usually better. Okay, so how would you select a paper to download? You need to read it. You read it that first. Okay, if it's three lines, people tend to ignore it. If it's if it's a one line, it's always better. And avoid terms such as uh, first ever or superior or enhanced. Enhanced is kind of okay, but first ever avoid first ever or superior. If you say that you have to give proper justification for that. Also the other words such as highly efficient, green, environmentally benign. If you are using those kind of words, you need to have appropriate justification for that particular words. Otherwise, the paper can be rejected just based on that fact. Why title is important? So I got this from um, uh, ESES website. This is uh, Professor Via Ma says, uh, usually I have a quick look at the title. If interested, then I go to the abstract. And if it's not an interesting title, I just forget it. So this is the way most of the people read a paper. They go through the title first, then the abstract. If those are not relevant or eye-catching, they're not going to download it, they're not going to read your paper. In an editorial perspective, the editor also sees the title first, then the abstract. Then he or she go through the, the content of the paper. So it's very, very important to have a good abstract and a good title. Abstract is the most important part for editors or reviewers. And that's the pitch. And it should stand alone. You need to say why this work is important. Be specific, straightforward. And it should be 200 or 250 to 500 words, depending on the journal guidelines. You should select the right keywords. There's no point in repeating a word which is already in the title or abstract. For example, if you use the word photocatalysis in the title or abstract, you could use photocatalytic and that will increase your search chances. Okay, always remember that. Uh, always remember to use the word which, which is not used in the title or abstract. When somebody Googles it, uh, if somebody Googles photocatalytic, for example, your paper will come up also. If you use photocatalysis again in the keyword and somebody uses photocatalytic, your pa paper may not appear. Okay, so it's very, very important to remember that point too. How you write an introduction? The first paragraph is very, very important. I was talking to my boss, Professor John Kelly, and John once told me that the first paragraph of whatever you write, your thesis, your paper, or, or a manuscript or review, anything, your grandmother should be able to understand that. It may be slightly exaggerated, but the point is a lay person should be able to understand the first paragraph of your work. You have to give a kind of global perspective. For example, if you are talking about water sterilization or disinfection of water using photocatalysis, this is a photocatalytic group so, uh, uh, or AOP group, advanced oxidation process group. 
So let us talk about uh, a work in uh, advanced oxidation process. How do you write the first paragraph? You can give a global, uh, for example, if you are working on disinfection, you can say that over a billion people lack access to clean water. Or you say that over a billion people die every year because of diarrhea due to unsafe drinking of water. So that will give a kind of global perspective. Then you can talk about there are certain technologies available. So these are the chlorination, for example, chlorination has tried previously and, and those have some disadvantages. It wouldn't kill a certain type of bacteria. And you explain all the available technologies. Then you say, the technology we are presenting has additional advantages. You can say that this particular technology could kill cryptosporidium, for example. Other technologies wouldn't be able to kill cryptosporidium, but your te new technology will, do, and that is the novelty. So you start from very general, then address all the technologies available, discuss about its disadvantages, and that's the gap. And then you talk about the advantages of your, or what, that is what you are bringing to the table. Explain that. And that's how you write. And then you write the objectives of the work. So what is published so far? What is missing? That's the gap. Then you identify the novelty and then you explain the objectives. So that is how you write the introduction. The methodology, it should be reproducible. Somebody else should be able to reproduce your work. So every minute detail should be given. What I meant by that, for example, if you are making or doing a chemical reaction to prepare a material for advanced oxidation process. So you develop this catalyst uh, using salt gel, for example, salt gel techniques. So you mix two different types of chemicals, stir it for five minutes, kept it for 10 minutes, and then stir again for another five minutes. Rather than saying it was stirred for 10 minutes, you say that it was stirred initially for five minutes, kept it for 10 minutes, and then stirred again for five minutes. Even though it wasn't intentional, you should give that type of minute details. Because chemical reactions can be very sensitive. So every minute detail should be given so that other person can reproduce it. It should be complete and it should give correct information and all relevant details should be provided. So the results, you don't have to give all the results. You don't have to put all the XRD data or XPS. You only provide the representative results. Very important that you should give high definition figures and graphs. Move unimportant results to the supporting information. And in the results, it should logically progress to the next section. Remember, it should flow like a story. So every paper has its own logical progression. For example, if you're writing a materials paper, so first thing could be XRD, then FTIR, Raman, then the XPS after that, and then the photocatalytic results. And then you come back again and then explain it. So there should be a logical progression of that result. 
a quality of figures are very very important quality of figures and graphics because how people read the paper think about the last paper you downloaded from from um, your portal or or from from the journal of, uh, you like you read the title you briefly gone through the abstract that what did you after what did you do after that you went through the graphics you went through the figures so you should remember always put high quality figures and graphics it's very very important so when you write a high impact paper it's very very important to put high quality figures on tables so the discussion part is the selling point and when i read many papers i only see results there are no discussion so you need to provide the discussion of the results what does that mean discussion of the results means you compare your work with previous works you give proper references you discuss it you explain it for the reader so that is how you discuss your work you need to give proper justifications support it with previous studies added advantages and use appropriate references and conclusions are not rewording the abstract conclusions are conclusions of your work you should also talk about advances in the field from the state of the art and lay, uh, and finally you should give a line on future directions where you are going towards the next references are also very very important cite the main references main scientific publication on which your work is based recent articles a good balance is required always remember to give uh, some of the recent articles 2021 2020 2020 uh, 2019 etc now avoid excess self citations you can give like a, a, a some uh, it, sometimes it's very difficult to write a paper without your own citation that's okay like uh, you need to explain it um, your own work at, at certain points to substantiate a point that's fine or in the introduction you can say that this work was done and that's very important to cite as well but if you write, if you write a paper always avoid self citation excess self citations roughly 5% or 10% are so are okay if you if you write 50 references and uh, 45 are you are wrong that is not justified if you have 50 maybe three or four or five are you are wrong that's okay there are no rules like that but generally speaking it's it's fine so I have submitted my paper. What happens next? So the review channels, we discussed that, the editorial office, editor-in-chief, editor, and the reviewer. So what is the most important thing when, you're, when you start writing a paper? What is the Bible for writing a paper? What should you refer first? The guidelines, isn't it? The other guidelines. Writing a paper is like playing football. You have to follow certain rules. And many journals have templates available. Check if that uh, particular journal you are going to publish has templates. And if, if yes, always download it and, and write your or uh, type your paper in that particular template. So once you finish your paper, I'm concluding, I will conclude in next five minutes. So once you finish your paper, you need to write a nice cover letter 
to the editor. Always address by name if possible, if you know the editor whom you are submitting. Dear Professor Kelly, uh, it's a pleasure to submit our papers, blah, blah, blah. And then you have to explain the novelty of the work. Then you explain why should it be published? And you have to say that why should it be in this journal? Then you might say whether it is specialized or multidisciplinary audiences. Or you can say that this is this work is suitable for both specialized and multidisciplinary readers of Journal of Chemical Engineering or Applied Catalysis B. So what are the tips? Quality with significant novelty. So quality is very, very important and you need to have significant novelty as well. Correct fit of the subject area. Work should be high impact. Keep your readers in mind. Keep your reviewers in mind. Data analysis with strong literature support. A thought provoking discussion. A good conclusion is very, very important. And then learn to live with the rejection. Don't be disappointed. You may not know this, but most of the journal or many of the journals, only less than 30% of the paper will be accepted. So if it's not accepted, if, if a particular journal don't like your paper, go to the next journal. And it always happens in the scientific field. And don't get offended if your paper is rejected. It may not be suitable to that particular journal. You get all the comments, address it, and then submit to another journal. There are plenty of journals available. So how would you respond uh, to the uh, revision request? You should answer all the questions and comments. You should submit two different manuscripts. So one is the clean manuscript and the second manuscript with changes highlighted. Write it in a different font so that it will be easier for the editor and the reviewer to read it or review it or highlight it. You have to also say what are the other corrections made. You may have corrected a few typos. You may have added an additional paragraph which was not requested by the reference, but you have to highlight that part too. So finally, learn from your mistakes. So submit a paper and then you can learn from those mistakes. Uh, like when, when you get the reviewer comments, you may have forgotten on important characterization method and the referee pointed out that. So you learn a lot of things by doing. So even if it's not complete, You, you can still submit and get the, um, the reviewer comments so that your paper can be improved and, and submit to the next journal. So mistakes are painful when they happen, but years late, a collection of mistakes, mistakes is what is called experience. So with that note, I would like to conclude and thank you for your attention. And I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. 
Uh, thank you, Suresh, for very informative and very detailed uh, presentation. It will be very helpful for us. So I would like to ask a question first, like we have uh, open access uh, publications as well. So what's your take on uh, to publish in an open access journal? Yeah, in my opinion, um, everybody should be publishing in uh, open access journals as much as possible, mm -hmm. uh, because most of the journals now allow to publish uh, open access. Uh, with a fee. Uh, so if your research fund allow, uh, my recommendation is to publish open access to, so that it will be more accessible to the public. Yeah, yeah. yeah th uh, th thank you. And we are getting a few questions. So first one from Ambika Devi, how to identify papers in the field of photocatalysis that should not be missed? That should not be? Missed. Okay, so you can put yeah. alerts. Uh, there are several ways you can put alerts, like a science direct alert is one. Um, and also like you can put a Google uh, scholar alerts. If you are following a particular uh, author or sorry, a particular author, for example, you can put alerts for that particular author in Google scholar. You can also put Google alerts uh, for a particular keyword. Okay, so there are se several ways you can do it. And also check web of science regularly. Um, and another another comments from Avinash Arpai. Uh, it's very informative talk, Professor Pillai. Apart from PPT, could you suggest any other tool for making good illustrations and TOC? Yeah, um, illustrations and TOC. Uh, we use uh, uh, Adobe Illustrator and mm -hmm. uh, also Photoshop. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a number of other tools available, uh, um, which I'm not aware. You can add that, Sneha, because you are very good in. Uh, in graphics. Yeah, uh, so in our group, we use uh, PowerPoints uh, and Adobe Illustrator, and um, uh, he, we, uh, we even use uh, deck, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, a similar kind of, even use 3D Paint tool as yeah. well. So yeah. even if we edit it in, uh, in Photoshop, and we use, uh, uh, even 3D softwares as well. It okay. depends upon what kind of image you're looking for. So and, uh, another question, it's from Ansaf. What should we make of editorial rejections from high impact journals without any comments? Yeah, usually you will get a comment, uh, like editors under huge pressure uh, because uh, uh, like the, the number of papers arriving on the editorial desk. Um, so if it's not significant, if they don't feel, that it, it has any significant novelty, uh, they will reject it. So like accept it and then uh, go to the next level of the journal. So it's a part of our daily life, you know, like uh, both editors and also authors. Um, so my recommendation is like, uh, if you get any comments, address it and submit to, the, submit to another journal. So yeah, uh, and another uh, um, from Hamel Ayas. Uh, thank you, very informative, much needed. Uh, how can we differentiate between technical novelty and applied research from scientific one? As most of the high impact gives technical novelty issue. So. Yeah, that's a very important point. Uh, technical novelty is very, very important as well. And uh, in that case, uh, uh, you need to identify um, that specialized journal which publish that type of technical novelty. So uh, like your paper will find somewhere. Um, it, it can be published uh, somewhere. It may not be in nature or science, but like if you look, if you, if you browse through the, the publisher sites, you will identify a journal which is more appropriate to that type of work. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And uh, next one from Mohsin. Uh, thanks for the wonderful session, Professor Pillai. My point is how to avoid jargon or technical word in a good scientific paper. Yeah, you need, you like, um, it's very difficult to avoid technical terms and jargons. Uh, and it's important as well, because you cannot write a paper without uh, technical terms in it. But uh, mm -hmm. when you write an abstract, um, like uh, it, it's always better to write in a kind of layperson's language because abstract is, is the one like you are conveying that message for a wide range of readers. But again, uh, even in the abstract, you need to use technical words and technical terms uh, to justify 
your work. So it's yeah. often difficult uh, to write a paper without technical terms yeah, or jargon. That's... Okay. And, um... And another question from Alex. Um, as an editor, do you consider where the paper is coming from or the authors before making any decisions? No. Regarding the, okay. No, the yeah. quality is, is the most important. So that is the advice we get from uh, senior editors. You know, like uh, um, mm -hmm. you don't have to look at uh, the affiliation or the country uh, or, or the people or anything. You no, know? like uh, the quality is the most important thing. So most of the editors, or all of the editors are following um the same role so they look at the quality of the work yeah and we have a few more minutes for the question and yeah please please ch uh, chat in your questions um so another question from mohsin what is conflict of interest means for an author yeah conflict of in, in, uh, interest means um uh, it, it, like uh, it has a multi-fault meaning um uh, like um the conflict of interest can be with the referees, for example. So if you uh, if you are working, um, if you identify a referee who is uh, a potential referee who is working in your area, uh, and uh, uh, him or she may um, like uh, sees your work as a kind of competitor's work. So you can identify that type of reviewer as a kind of uh, of, of of person with conflict of interest, and you can say that like uh, uh, you can uh, say that uh, I don't want to see uh, pros Rex and Y as an editor. So that is a type of conflict of interest and also conflict of interest uh, in your work as, because it's a, if it's a paid work from a company to publish uh, a work, okay? So that is a conflict of interest. So most of the journals now needs a statement that there is no conflict of interest. Uh, or is a, pub, a private agency giving you money to publish a work. So that is yeah. another example of, of, of conflict of interest as well. Uh, thank you, Suresh. And uh, another, uh, okay, um, uh, another question from Hamil Ayas is, how to handle the pilgrims from some technical words as mostly technical words are used in various amount of published results. Sorry, can you repeat the first yeah, part of yeah. the? Yeah, how to handle the pilgrims from some technical words, as mostly technical words are used in various amount of published results. Yeah, like why should you avoid technical words? You have to use technical words in, in publications. You oh. have to use it, uh, yeah. but. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, it was a plagiarism. Thanks oh, plagiarism, sorry, sorry. Yeah. okay, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, plagiarism. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, plagiarism. Uh, you don't like. Uh, it's okay because the the software wouldn't identify those type of um, technical words in the plagiarism. Uh, plagiarism means that uh, you are copying. It's a word by word copying of of a couple of lines or maybe a paragraph. Okay, yeah. a few words or technical words. The software wouldn't identify those. And I think it's relevant to keep all the technical words when you're writing a paper as well, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and uh, I would like to add a question that uh, for how long will it, uh, the paper will be with the editor before we know that the decision? Like Usually, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. most of the journals uh, will let you know within a month, okay? okay. So it varies yeah. from like, some journals are very quick, so 12 days yeah. up to, 30 days and uh, it could be up to 45 days some cases yeah. because depending on the reviewer also particularly in the pandemic time uh, mm -hmm. uh, people are under uh, tremendous pressure yeah. uh, with other aspects of life as well so uh, but generally it's 12 days to 45 days is the is the yeah. normal time yeah uh, thanks uh, Suresh. so we have uh, um, two more um, minutes so yeah. And yes, uh, for for the Avinash question, I think Ahmed uh, he's like that. A number of design softwares can be used, like Illustrator, Blender, LinkSpace, and Autodesk Fusion. So all these uh, softwares we are also using in here as well. So thanks, Ahmed, for the answer. And if 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 do you have any? If anyone has any more questions to ask, um, we'll wait for a um, moment and. 
thanks again, Pro Professor Rish, that it's, it's very informative and it is very detailed and it helped me as well and everyone, I'm, I'm sure. So, thank you. And um, so, if, if we have any no more questions, then should I conclude it? I would like to thank uh, the organizers uh, for yeah. arranging this talk. And also I would like to thank uh, Chris and uh, Sneha for the for organizing everything. Sneha, thanks for the kind introduction and uh, for managing everything. Chris for organizing mm -hmm. the Zoom and um, also the general management. Thank you both. Yeah. Yeah, and I just want to say um, uh, thanks again for the Suresh uh, for the talk, and I want to uh, thank Chris Odaud, my colleague. He helped me out throughout this process, and uh, all this all this uh, are recorded, so we'll be uploading in the YouTube YouTube channel. And uh, thanks again, Professor Luigi, uh, for organizing this webinar series. So thanks again, and thank you for joining us. Uh, um, and I hope you have a nice day. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Luigi. Uh, hi, Suresh. Thank you very much Hi, for your yeah. presentation. Hi, Znemol. Thank you very much. Yeah. It was yeah. a really interesting presentation. And uh, yeah. I also used to have this kind of talk, if you remember, in yes. for the school members, yes. And uh, I think it's uh, really useful for PhD students. And uh, I really appreciated and enjoyed very much, in particular, your first part of presentation with this, you know, recall with yeah. Titanic story that it's actually it's a, like a story to write a paper for sure and uh, yeah. so thank you very much both of all yeah. and uh, I would like just remind you when available if you can send me the link to the video yeah. okay so yeah. I can yeah. uh, post in uh, in our YouTube channel okay yeah, yeah. thank you very much bye bye yeah. thank, thank you, you thank, Luigi. You, thank yeah. you all thank you. bye yeah. thank you bye